Romans chapter 5. Justified by faith. Romans 5 verse 1 Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, by the faith of Jesus Christ, we are justified, made just, and are no longer at war, enmity, with God. He no longer views us as the children of our father, the devil. He now sees us as his children. This all comes about only through the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. God is not at enmity with us today in the dispensation of grace. Romans 5 verse 2 By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. It is only by faith in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross for us that we have access to God's grace. The glory of God, the holiness that God alone has. Christ lived a sinless life. Hebrews 4 verse 15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Romans 5 verses 3 to 5 And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope, and hope mocketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The Holy Ghost was given to us the moment we trusted Christ for our salvation. Then we were placed into the body of Christ and sealed in his love for eternity. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 KJV For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Romans 5 verse 6 For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. In due time, since mankind was unable to save themselves, Christ died for the ungodly, at the appointed time. Galatians 4 verse 4 But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Romans 5 verses 7 to 8 For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commendeth his love toward us. He showed us his love. While only very few would give their lives for the average moral guy that lives down the street, only a few more may make the ultimate sacrifice for a close friend or family member. Christ actually died for the worse in all of us, from the child molester to the mass murderer. He doesn't wait for us to clean up our act before he saves us. Romans 5 verse 9 Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Being now justified by his blood, we are declared just by Christ's sinless blood. Christ had to die and shed his innocent blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him, because we are justified, we are now delivered from wrath, hell, as well as the tribulation period, for those alive when the rapture occurs. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 10 For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we were enemies, Christ's substitutionary death on the cross reconciled us who were at enmity with God, at war. We shall be saved by his life. Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Romans 5 verse 11 And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement, each believer receives the atonement upon salvation, which is best described as the at one meant we have because we are saved. Our sins were atoned for by Christ. Romans 5 verse 12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. As by one man sin entered into the world, the one man is Adam, Eve was deceived. 
God holds Adam accountable because after that he had received the only law ever given to him, and he just stood there silent beside Eve as Satan deceived her. And death by sin, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23 The soul that sinneth it shall die. So, death passed upon all men, Cain, Abel, and Seth were all born sinners, and all who followed after born sinners as well. For that all have sinned, before our salvation we were all in Adam, in his loins. We sinned in Adam. Now that we are in Christ, he makes us righteous. Adam's sin brought death to all mankind because Adam died in the day that he ate of the fruit because he did not make it to his second day in God's eyes. 2 Peter 3 verse 17 Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Adam unfortunately passed sin down to all the future generations so that all are born in sin. Death is both physical and spiritual separation from God for eternity for the person who dies in their sins. Romans 5 verse 13 For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Until the law sin was in the world, the imputation of sin comes with the knowledge of sin, which came with the giving of the law. Before there was the written law, mankind was under his conscience, and what few commandments God had given to mankind before that time. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. It does not say there were no consequences for sin. There were consequences for Adam's sin, Cain's sin, and on and on. Romans 5 verse 14 Nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, the wages of sin still was death, even though the law had not come into being yet. Romans 6 verse 23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The similitude of Adam's transgression, their sin was not identical to Adam's sin. The figure of him that was to come, Adam, is a type of Christ. Types we must remember are not a perfect picture of what they portray. No human ever born could perfectly represent Christ because all mankind are sinners and he was without sin. Jesus was neither born in sin, as are all of us, nor has he ever committed any sin. Romans 5 verse 15 But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. The offense, this is sin. The fall. Paul switches from using the word all in verse 12 to the less inclusive word many in this passage because he has now divided the all up into two camps, saved and lost. The free gift, salvation. The gift by grace. All of the lost today are still dead in their trespasses and sins, while the many who are saved have received the gift of the grace of God by Jesus Christ through faith. Romans 5 verses 16 to 17 And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Condemnation, because of Adam's sin we were all born in sin. Justification, because of Christ's righteousness, we can all be justified by faith by receiving the gift of righteousness. Romans 5 verses 18 to 19 Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. By the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ was born without sin because of the virgin birth, and he never sinned even on time. Isaiah 7 verse 14, Matthew 1 verse 23, and Hebrews 4 verse 15. Romans 5 verse 20 Moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The law entered, that the offense might abound. The law entered at Mount Sinai. The offense is the sin of Adam. 
2,000 years had passed since Adam sinned until God gave Moses the law to Israel to show them his holiness and their exceeding sinfulness. Romans 5 verse 21 that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. As sin hath reigned unto death, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23 Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life, grace's reign is eternally more far-reaching than the reign of sin ever could be. Sin reigns until death in the life of a lost man, but it can only reign in a believer's life as he gives into it. Grace reigns when we yield to the Spirit and allow it to have control in our lives. Romans chapter 6 Baptized into Jesus Christ Romans 6 verse 1 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin, we are not to force God's hand in dispensing more of his grace by our continuing in sin, only a wicked man would even consider such foolishness. Romans 3 verse 8 Romans 6 verse 2 God forbid. How shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? We that are dead to sin, once we are saved, we are dead to sin, this doesn't mean we are not tempted to sin because we are still carrying around our sinful flesh. We will always have that battle as long as we live in our flesh. See Paul's battle in Romans 7. Paul is talking about our spiritual death to sin that occurred, which occurred when we were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. Living in sin is not just shacking up with someone who is not your spouse, it is living in defeat to any sin. Living in continual sin should not be practiced by us because we are to let Christ now live through us. Romans 6 verse 3 Know ye not, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Baptized into Jesus Christ, this is our baptism by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ, which occurs at our salvation. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Colossians 1 verses 18 to 24 And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that, which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Galatians 3 verses 26 to 27 For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If verse 3 were speaking of water baptism, then water baptism would save us, but this verse speaks of the Spirit's baptizing us into Jesus Christ's body and into his death. Getting immersed in water doesn't put you in Christ, but believing on him does. We literally died to our flesh and then buried it spiritually at the moment of our salvation. The big problem is that our flesh keeps trying to resurrect itself daily, and we in turn need to die to it daily, spiritually speaking. Baptized into his death, did Jesus Christ ever sin? No, sin had no hold over him. Death could not hold him because he was not guilty of sin, the offense. Romans 6 verse 4 Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We are buried with him by baptism into death. Water baptism does not place us into Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that takes us out of Adam's sinfulness, who then places us into the righteousness of Christ. Walk in newness of life. We are to walk in the newness of life, not as the old man walked.
Romans 6 verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Planted together in the likeness of his death, to be planted means to be placed into the ground. If you say these verses are speaking symbolically of water baptism, then you have to translate this verse to say, if we have been planted together in water, then we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Many have been baptized in water, immersion, and with water, sprinkling, who did not trust in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for their justification, and they will die in their sin. Christ died our death for us because we could not pay the wages of our sin. When Christ died, all who believed on him died with him. It was a supernatural act where we were placed into Christ, baptized into Christ's body, the moment we believed the gospel, not the moment we got wet. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Your body will be raised from the dead at the rapture in the likeness of Christ's body being raised from the dead. You are not raised because of your own righteousness, but because of his righteousness, that is why it says in the likeness of his resurrection and not exactly as Christ was raised from the dead. You and I have no power to raise ourselves from the dead because we are sinners. He was not. Not because you or I went through a water ritual, but because you trusted in the gospel of your salvation. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Romans 6 verses 6 to 7 knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Our old man is crucified with him, the old us before our salvation. Ephesians 4 verses 22 to 24 that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Colossians 3 verses 9 to 10 line not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him that the body of sin might be destroyed, when our sinful body is physically buried it will eventually decay into dust. Christ literally died our death for us, so that we wouldn't have to pay the wages of our sin, which is death and hell for eternity. We were the servants of sin before our old man died with Christ, so we should no longer serve our flesh. Because of our new nature we are now free to serve our new master Christ. A circumcision of the heart takes place at our salvation that cuts the flesh away from our soul and spirit, so it is no more us that sin, but our old flesh that we carry around with us. Freed from sin, the new man is not free from ever sinning again, we are freed from the wages of sin. Romans 6 verse 23. Romans 6 verse 8 Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We be dead with Christ. This is speaking in the present tense. Christ died our death 2000 years ago. We shall also live with him. This is speaking in the future tense. It is speaking of our eternal life in heavenly places. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 3 For this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Romans 6 verses 9 to 11 Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death hath no more dominion over him. Hebrews 7 verse 27. Reckon ye also to be dead indeed unto sin, we are to reckon the old man dead with Christ when we are tempted, and then reckon the new man alive through Christ. Because of what Christ did for us coupled with our faith, sin does not have to have dominion over us unless we choose to let it. Even a lost person can control to a certain degree the lust of the flesh. How much the more should a child of God be victorious over sin with God's Spirit indwelling them? Romans 6 verse 12 Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. 
because Christ has already won the victory over sin, we need to remind ourselves of that and resist the flesh's attempts to re-enslave us on a daily basis. Romans 6 verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Neither yield ye your members, our mind and our body parts. Because you have been made alive in Christ, you need to submit your mind and body to glorify Christ and not give place to the flesh. Romans 6 verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Ye are not under the law. The law was a schoolmaster to convince Israel that they needed a savior. Under grace, we have a savior and all we have to do is to remind ourselves of this and then yield our members unto Christ. Romans 6 verses 15 to 16, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness? We are not under the law, but under grace. These words are put in two adjoining verses to hopefully get the point across that we are under the dispensation of grace now. First, Paul tells us that we should not sin because we are now under grace, and now he tells us that we should not sin because we are not under the law. Since a lost person is to be judged by the law one day, why would we who are free from that law want to serve that old master? If we choose to serve sin while under grace, then the natural consequences of our sins will occur. When they partook of the Lord's Supper with sin in their life, God stepped in, and as the scriptures say, some were sick, and some were fallen asleep, dead, because of their service to sin. The question must be asked is, is this still happening today? No, it is not. Romans 6 verses 17 to 18, But God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Ye have obeyed from the hearth that form of doctrine which was delivered you. This speaks of the gospel of the grace of God in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Upon your faith in Christ your body was circumcised and cut free from your soul and spirit, so that when you sin it is no longer you, your soul and spirit, that sins, but your body. Romans 1 verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, Romans 16 verse 26, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It is your spirit that is free from sin. Your fleshly body is still under the curse, and the desire to sin will continue to plague you until you receive a new body when you get to heaven. Romans 6 verses 19 to 20 I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Because of the infirmity of your flesh, because of the weakness of our sinful flesh. Romans 6 verse 21 What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? A marriage is to produce offspring, fruit. Israel became an adulterous wife, and she produced no fruit. Luke 13 verses 1 to 9 There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Were those eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. 
Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Romans 6 verse 22 But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. But now being made free from sin, we are born sinners, slaves to sin, but upon salvation we become servants to God. To be free from sin is similar to a slave who has been set free, he doesn't have to go back to his old master and serve him anymore, but sometimes we do just that with our flesh when we sin. Romans 6 verse 23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Wages are what we are owed for the work we have done. The wage for our sin is death, an eternal separation from God for eternity in the lake of fire, but the gift of God saves us from the wages of our sin. The gift of God is eternal life. A gift is free for those who will simply receive it by faith. Eternal life has been paid for by Jesus Christ by his sacrificial death on the cross on our behalf. Chapter 7 To death do us part. Romans 7 verse 1 Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. I speak to them that know the law. Paul here speaks not just to those Jewish believers who know the law of Moses, but also to all in Rome that understand law in general. Have not pagans been governed by laws? Paul uses the law to teach about man's standing and state under grace as opposed to their previous standing under the law. Since God gave mankind the law, he will judge the lost man by it. We on the other hand, if we have been saved, are freed from the law and its penalty. Anyone who knows the law knows that the death of an individual annuls any contracts. What a person was bound to under the law he is released from by his death. If a person were bound to someone by a particular law and either of the two people died that contract would be null and void unless there were stipulations in the contract that specified what was to happen in the event of a death. Paul, however, uses the marriage contract to teach our relationship as believers to the law today while under grace. Romans 7 verses 2 to 3 For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. The woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Israel is the wife of Jehovah, bound in a marriage relationship to him until death. The law of her husband, it is stated in the beginning of verse 2, but it is from Exodus. She, Israel, commits adultery with others' gods, and God gives Israel a writing of divorcement. She is no longer his wife. Isaiah 50 verse 1 Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man, God dies on the cross to buy her, Israel, back. The heathen woman does not think for a second that she is an adulteress if she leaves her husband and marries another. It is the one who knows the law of Moses that can make that distinction. The husband here in this illustration is God, and Israel as we know was married to God through the law covenant, for the law was a legal contract between Israel and God. Isaiah 50 verse 1 an adulteress, in a legal sense an adulteress is a married woman who left her husband to be with another man, without her husband having broken the marriage covenant by his own infidelity. Israel, over and over again, is called an adulteress because she continually played the harlot, spiritually speaking, by worshipping other gods, while God all the while remained faithful unto her, Israel. 
Paul uses this common law that is understood by most to teach us that because Christ fulfilled the law, it is now dead to us so that we are free to be married to another. This would be a necessary teaching that the Jewish hearers needed to hear so they could move on from the old to the new. Romans 7 verse 4 Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Israel could never keep the law and so the contract that Israel had made with God died when Christ fulfilled it at the cross. He became a curse for us on the cross and by his dead body we were freed from the law. When we believe on Christ for our salvation we are no longer under the curse of the law. Notice in verse 4 that it is no longer referring to the law as dying, but Paul says it is you who have become dead to the law by the body of Christ. We are crucified with Christ. The law is nailed to the cross and it dies. We are freed from that law when we believe, which circumcises our heart, or literally it separates our flesh from our soul and spirit all by the body of Christ, the literal body of Christ, and not the church, which is his body. Our bodies did not literally die when we believed, but Christ's body died, and we have received deliverance from the law because of his body's death. We have become dead to the law by his sinless body. That ye should be married to another, verse 4 teaches that we as believers are married to Christ. This has unfortunately scared many that have learned that the body of Christ, the church, is not the bride of Christ, believing Israel is the bride of Christ, and they will dwell in the city of New Jerusalem. This is talking about saved individuals being married to Christ. It is not talking about the church being married to Christ. That we should bring forth fruit unto God, the fruit of a marriage is their offspring or children. All of our righteousness in the flesh are as filthy rags in God's eyes, they are the fruit that is unto death, but now that we are saved our good deeds are fruits unto God that are well pleasing in his sight. Romans 7 verses 5 to 6 For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. When we were in the flesh, we were literally held prisoners by our flesh before we died with Christ. But now we are delivered from the law, the Holy Spirit now indwells us, and we serve our new husband, Christ, out of love and not out of law. When Paul speaks of being in the flesh in the past tense, he is referring to the time before we were saved. At our salvation, our flesh is cut away by the Holy Spirit from our soul and spirit, and we are now literally two separate people, the spirit man and the flesh man, both of which are at war with one another. Romans 7 verse 7 What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Since the law worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death, the natural question one would ask then is, Is the law sin? Of course not. We don't blame a lawmaker when someone kills someone, we blame the killer. It is not the law that is at fault either because it is simply the standard of righteousness that is expected to be obeyed. The problem many have with the law of God is that its standard of righteousness is impossible to maintain for anyone because it expects total obedience which only one man has ever been able to obtain and that was Christ. That is what the law of God is supposed to do by convicting us of our sin and our need for God and his righteousness and thereby drawing us to our only hope of salvation. Romans 7 verses 8 to 9 But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Sin, taking occasion, sin did not all of a sudden revive at the giving of the law, but it did in a sense in the mind of the hearers of the law on that day. Before the law Israel was ignorant of its precepts but upon hearing it the knowledge of sin was awakened in them and it was an overwhelming sensation. All manner of concupiscence, all types of sinful desires. For without the law sin was dead, before the law sin was not imputed unto man when there was no law. 
Romans 5 verse 13. When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died when the law came. Romans 7 verses 10 to 12 and the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. The commandment, which was ordained to life, read what Jesus said concerning the law in Luke 10 verses 25 to 28, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. The law was given for man to realize that he was dying because he was a sinner and his sin had separated him from his Creator, and he needed a Savior. Sin's ultimate end is death, but the ultimate end of the law was to point people to the only one who can give life, and that is Christ. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me, sin, taking occasion by the law and commandment. Romans 7 verse 13 was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The law was and is a good thing because it shows us why we are all going to die one day. It shows us our need for a savior. It shows us our need to be delivered from this sin-cursed body we live in. The law is good if its purpose is understood. It is also a standard that shows us when we disobey and obey God. Romans 7 verses 14 to 18 For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. The law is spiritual, from God. I am carnal, sinful flesh. Paul is not trying to make excuses for his flesh, he is simply teaching a biblical truth that takes place in the life of a believer when they get saved and that continues on throughout their life. Romans 7 verses 19 to 21 For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Our spirit is not the one committing sins, for it cannot sin. It is our flesh which has been cut away from our spirit. Romans 7 verses 22 to 23 For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. The law of God, verse 25. The law of my mind, verse 25. The law of sin, verse 25. Again, we see two men in one here, the spiritual man and the fleshly man, both coexisting in the same geographical space, but both at war with one another. There is coming a day when the fleshly man which is in a state of corruption will die and put on incorruption as Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15 and then the battle of the two men or natures will be over. Romans 7 verses 24 to 25 O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. The body of this death, our sinful body which is depraved and wants to satisfy its fleshly desires. At salvation the flesh was cut away from the spirit, so that with the mind we can serve God, it is our flesh that is weak which wants to serve its master, which is sin. Christ has delivered believers from the body of this death. The law of God, righteousness, holiness. Romans 6 verse 19. The law of sin, unrighteousness.
Romans 6 verse 23. Chapter 8. In Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verses 1 to 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, you were placed into Christ's body the moment you believed the gospel. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Once a person is in Christ Jesus, he can never be condemned. John 5 verse 24 the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, we have a new nature now as believers. The law of sin and death, the soul that sinneth it shall die. Christ does not tell us that we are free from ever sinning again or from death. Our flesh must pay the penalty of sin, which is death. But if you are saved, your soul and spirit has already been cut free from your body. Romans 8 verses 3 to 4 for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It was weak through the flesh. The law was weak because of the human element involved, our flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in sinful flesh, as each one of us did at our birth. This speaks of the virgin birth. Isaiah 7 verse 14 and Matthew 1 verse 23. The necessity of the virgin birth was so that God's son could come without sinful flesh. When God originally created Adam, he made him after his own likeness in Genesis 1 verse 26, but Adam sinned and corrupted that likeness. Adam's sons were not born in the likeness of God as their father was created. Instead, they were born in sin after the likeness of their father, Adam. When Christ came, he was not in the likeness of you and I as fallen sons of Adam, but he came in the likeness of Adam prior to his fall without sin. Romans 8 verses 8 to 10. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The body is dead, a lost person can't please God because he is not in Christ, but he is still in sinful Adam. Romans 5 verses 10 to 12. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. This is speaking of the righteousness of Christ. Romans 5 verses 10 to 12. Romans 8 verse 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Quicken your mortal bodies to make alive. Psalm 71 verse 20 Thou, which hast shewed me great and sore troubles, shalt quicken me again, and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. The believer has the sure hope that God shall make his dead body alive by the power of the Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance, the down payment, at the moment we believe the gospel. Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Romans 8 verses 12 to 13 Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We are debtors, because the Spirit quickens our mortal bodies, we are debtors to the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body. We are to tell the flesh no. Romans 8 verses 14 to 15 For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
The sons of God, the scripture calls us the sons of God because we by faith believed in the Son of God and we were placed in Christ at that moment. This is not referring to us being sons of God by creation like the angels are referred to as. Genesis 6 and Job 2 The spirit of bondage again to fear, this is a reference to the law of Moses with its system of rules and regulations, tutors, and governors to lead. Israel was to be servants under that law. The spirit of adoption, we received the spirit of adoption the moment we were saved, and we are not seen as children needing to be led around by governors and tutors, but as fully mature sons and daughters of God. This is the first time that the word adoption is used in scriptures, and it does not mean what the modern definition of the word means. Adoption in scripture has to do with a child at a set time that is appointed of the father is adopted into the family with full rights and privileges of being a son. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, by the spirit of adoption, we cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8 verses 16 to 17, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we, believers, are the children of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. As children of God, we are heirs of God, and at the moment we trusted Christ we were received by God as his children, and then we were placed into his Son as heirs with him. If so be that we suffer with him, there are different levels of suffering that a person may go through as a believer simply because of where we were born. That we may be glorified also together. If you don't suffer with him, you will still be glorified for his suffering while you stand back and watch. Romans 8 verses 18 to 19 For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The sufferings of this present time, Paul, and the initial recipients of this epistle suffered greatly for their faith. The glory which shall be revealed in us, all we have suffered in this life is not even worth mentioning when compared to the glory we shall receive when the sons of God will one day be manifested at the onset of Christ's kingdom. The earnest expectation of the creature, the down payment we, the creature, received was the Holy Spirit the moment we got saved. The Holy Spirit seals us in the body of Christ and he will keep us secure until the rapture of the body of Christ. The manifestation of the sons of God, we will be fully manifest as the sons of God in a twinkling of an eye. Romans 8 verses 20 to 21 For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The bondage of corruption, we were made subject to vanity and one day we will lose these vile decaying bodies and put on a new one that will be recognized by all believers of all times just like when the disciples recognized Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration. The glorious liberty of the children of God, the freedom we will have for death, and sin in our new resurrected immortal bodies. Romans 8 verses 22 to 25 For we know that the whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together, because of Adam's fall, not only was all of humanity cursed, but all of creation as well, and one day soon the curse will be lifted from both, but until that day, we both are groaning and traveling in pain together. The first fruits of the Spirit, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit the moment we believed the gospel and are eternally secure in our salvation. The adoption, the redemption of the body at the rapture. Hope, we have the hope which the non-believer does not that we are saved and already possess everything that God has for us, and we are just waiting to receive it.
Romans 8 verses 26 to 27 Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself mocketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he mocketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit itself mocketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. All believers have the Spirit indwelling us. According to the will of God, the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't know how or what to pray for or what to do. He is our intercessor. The Spirit intercedes in our behalf to God and then He is used by God to minister back to us His response according to His will for us. Romans 8 verses 28 to 29 And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Them who are called according to his purpose, they are previously described as them that love God, not as someone chosen to be saved. Whom he did foreknow, this speaks of the mystery program regarding the church in the age of grace. Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 9 unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God had a plan before the world began to have a special organism called the body of Christ that would be conformed to the image of his son. Predestinate, predetermine. This word is dealt with in the next verse. Romans 8 verse 30 Moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Whom he did predestinate, we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son and called to be sons. Before time began God foreknew that Gentiles would be saved in this dispensation of grace and he predestinated those who would be saved to be conformed to the image of his Son. We are not predestined to be saved. Them he also called, those who he predestined to be conformed to his image. Them he also justified, those who were called, and predestinated. Justification is to be declared righteous by God. Them he also glorified, those who were justified, called, and predestined. Glorification is what every saved person receives one day. Romans 8 verses 31 to 32 What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Since God spared his own son for us, he will also freely give us all things. Our blessings are all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. It is Israel that has promised earthly blessings. Romans 8 verses 33 to 34 Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also mocketh intercession for us. Lay anything to the charge, level an accusation of guilt. God's elect, those God has elected to do his will. Since God has justified us, there is no charge that can be leveled against us by anyone that can carry any weight with God. No one can condemn someone that God has declared righteous. There are many things that are called elect in scripture that are in different ages under different programs, so to lump them all together will cause a perverse doctrinal view of election as many already have. There are elect today in the body of Christ which Paul speaks about in verse 33 and there are also elect in the Old Testament under the law that are different. The elect were the believing remnant up until the body of Christ was formed after the resurrection. Example, the Messiah is called mine elect in Isaiah as well as Israel herself is called my elect in the same book. The believing remnant of Israel during the tribulation period is also called the elect in Matthew and Revelations, but they are all different from the elect during the Grace Church Age. 
Romans 8 verses 35 to 36, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Psalm 44 verse 22, yeah, for thy sake are we killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Romans 8 verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors through Christ when all of life's trials come our way because we shall receive a far greater reward than we can imagine for the light trials that have come our way in this life. Romans 8 verses 38 to 39, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death, death can't separate us from the love of God, for it is then that we truly begin to live in His presence. This proves that soul sleep is unbiblical. Life, life can't separate either, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. Angels, Satan and his minions cannot separate us from the love of God. Principalities, nor powers, Satan's minions represented here, fallen angels. Things present, nor things to come, the certain trials of today or tomorrow. The things listed above are all powerful things, but they are only created things and no match for the Creator.